Hi there. So, um, <laughs> that light is yes. a little dark. So, um, Willoway Permaculture is um, a small farm in Niwot, two acres. We teach the permaculture design course. We, are, we have a herbal CSA. Um, we have internships. Um, we also have programs, educational programs for direct communication with nature and holistic body therapy that we, that we offer there. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about our programs because I'm so on fire about this issue. <laughs> GMOs, oh my God, what the, <laughs> are we eating? So if, how many of you are also fired up about this issue? How many of you really have, how many of you have seen Jeffrey Smith's site? I really recommend Jeffrey Smith's site. And um, GMO, K-N-O-W, has those um, DVDs out on the table for free. So if you don't know why people are so passionate about this issue, you really owe it to yourself to find out. It, the devil is in the details on this. Um, I thought I got it. And then I saw Jeffrey Smith's um, What You Have to Know About GMOs, and I'm like, this is way worse than I thought. Truly Franken food. You also owe it to your mother to get informed about this, Mother Earth. So a lot of people are asking, um, why are GMOs even considered on Boulder County open space? Well, we know who we're dealing with here. And so we have to consider uh, deception, coercion, who knows what. Um, and we have to, to, because Monsanto has come right out and said, we want to control seed supply worldwide. And so we have to really consider their tactics. We have to figure out how do they create the fear that motivates this level of control that's going on. And there actually is a lot of fear of weeds in the Boulder County open space planning and policy. So um, I wanted to have a nice bowl of fresh weeds that I could share with you to munch with me. Um, but the snow didn't cooperate. But local weeds, what are called the invasives, are some of the most nutritious and delicious plants that grow in our backyards and grow in open space. So um, they're considered invasives. I actually see a lot of invasive species among us. Like I don't see any Arapaho here or Cheyenne or you, you know. So I think that we need to, to really learn how to work with the invasives. The, the, the plant invasives are the local healers. They are the ones that are trying to heal the land and they're actually very effective at it. So mallow is a really common uh, weed. It's a demulcent. It really helps us keep our mucous membranes moist, especially this time of year. Uh, thistle is a nutrient accumulator. It's really great for our compost. It's good as mulch. It can be used as a lemonade, just the stems. Bindweed is used as a remedy for cancer. It's a phytoremediator, that is, a, a, it uptakes heavy metals, seven different types, including cadmium, one of the most difficult to remediate. It has a property similar to nitrogen fixation, and its deep roots bring up trace minerals and, and break up our heavy clay soil. So um, with proper management, bindweed could be a cover crop. We could be using it that way. It already is, oh my God. <laughs> Current, currently, we're taking our main food crops and we're sexually molesting them, arriving at genetically molested organisms. We're subjecting them to technological rape and leaving them sterile. This is so we can dump more toxins on the plant healers, the invasives, because they're so powerful that they have learned to adapt to four decades of toxic assault. So we've been influenced um, to believe that weeds truly are the enemy. Similarly, the media of the Vietnam era worked to convince us that the demonization of gooks was justification for defoliation of an entire country. And those companies amassed fortunes and power. And those same powers are now trying to justify poisoning our home backyards. 
GMOs, there's now a GMO uh, law in the state. So the potential for harm is really massive and it's irreversible. So the deeper question is how do we collectively coax ourselves out of a need to dominate and destroy? <laughs> 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 what an interesting How could that word. be five minutes. Like, going so no, fast. Going so fast. Okay, so if you would like to learn more about what we do, we have material out on the tables. Thank you. I'm just going to start things around. Um, so next we have Jim No Boulder, Mary Smith. Hi, everyone. At five minutes. At five minutes, and I'm going to do it really quick. Okay. So here's our website. We are a local um, education organization, 100% volunteer. We have no money. Um, we have done some amazing work with the volunteers that have participated over the last year in educating people in this community not only about what GMOs are, but about the local issue. And I'm here to tell you about the local issue, okay? <coughs> we have Boulder County open space. Almost 100,000 acres have been acquired over the last couple of decades by tax money. You, everybody that's in this room that lives in Boulder County have contributed. And of this 100,000 acres, we have 25,000 of it that's agricultural lands. Of that 25,000, about 17,000 is actually planted and grown. We've got 114, well this year 112 leases. Of those 112 leases, we have 70 farmers that lease these lands. And those 70 farmers are growing commodity crops. We have less than 600, less than 600 of these acres are actually being leased to, to organic farmers. Everybody else is leasing these 70,000 acres and planting things like <coughs> corn and sugar beets and sending these crops outside of our county. We never see them. The only people that are benefiting are the 70 farmers. And by the way, for the last 10 years, our county commission has allowed these farmers to plant GMOs in the form of BT corn. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with GMOs or BT corn, BT corn is actually a genetically modified version where they take viruses, um, bacteria and they splice it into the corn plant so that the corn plant actually produces in every single cell the pesticide Bt and we eat this stuff and not only do we eat it but the animals that we um, industrially you know graze so that we can then eat them are fed this stuff All right we are growing this on our county open space land and part of this technology by the way is also called Roundup Ready so they not only splice in the gene that allows the plant to produce Bt in every cell, they also splice in another gene that allows it to be Roundup ready, okay? Roundup is a pesticide, glyphosate. And what they do is they plant the corn, they plant the sugar beet, they, and then they spray glyphosate over the top of it. And because this is genetically modified so that it doesn't die when you spray it with a herbicide, it will grow. Well, it grows with the herbicide in it. So now we have a corn plant that not only has a pesticide, but it also is contaminated with herbicide. All right, now you gotta ask yourself, what's this doing to our commons, our publicly owned land? And what it's doing is it's ruining the future potential of the soil. Because what these chemicals do is they basically kill the bio life in the soil. We are diminishing and destroying the very thing that these soils provide to growing and living things. So if you ever study biology, if you ever study plant science, one of the things that you'll learn is that soil isn't just a medium that holds a plant in place. It is also what provides that plant with its nutrients. And what we are doing by utilizing this chemical agricultural practices, we are destroying the capacity of the soil to actually produce life, to produce healthful food. Now what we do with GM Know is we educate people about this. We also educate them about the fact that what we've got, thank you, what we've got is we've got right now a process going on in our county, which they've, they've developed a new cropland policy, 
The new cropland policy is recommending not only the continuation of BT corn on our open space land, but also other genetically modified crops. So what we're asking people to do is, I'm passing around these cards, there's a meeting on November 15th, please show up. Public comment is allowed. We need to let our county commissioners know that we are outraged by this. And the other thing is, is that if we do not get a policy that is focused on local sustainable practices, those lands will never be available to actually grow food for the people within this county. And right now, we produce less than 1% of the food that we consume within these boundaries. And we've got 25,000 acres of available land to do it in. Hmm. We need to change the focus and we need to change what those lands are used for. Out on the table, and you'll look at it, it's the community sponsored organizations. We have a bunch of information. Shopping guide, grab one. It's got great information, health risks, and then here's a one hour audio CD by Jeffrey Smith. It'll give you some really, really good background. Also on the back is take action. Please do um, email your county commissioners. Their um, email address is there. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Boulder Food Rescue with Caleb Phillips. Who I know will be on time because he's been looking at the stopwatch. <laughs> We will. <laughs> okay. We'll give you an extra five seconds. All right. All right. Hi, everybody. A lot of good talks. Yeah. I normally give talks in the academic sector. They're t typically really bad, so I'm pretty impressed by it. So, um, I'm Caleb. I'm the co-founder of Boulder Food Rescue. We're a two-month-old all-volunteer nonprofit. It's brand new. Um, we were founded on an observation, a really important one, that about 30% and maybe as much as 40% of the food that we produce in this country is thrown away. Yet, one in six Americans are hungry. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, that's about 10,000 individuals just in Boulder and Broomfield counties alone. So, as an example, um, bananas. Bananas are great. I brought some bananas um, that were rescued. Um, about a week ago, they were left over. So help yourself to some bananas and stickers also. So this is, this is where bananas come from. Um, that's Costa Rica. And that's where bananas mostly end up. That's a dumpster. So that sucks. Um, 3,272 miles just to end up in a landfill. Despite being a complicated problem, the solution isn't, isn't really that complicated. Basically, we have organizations in our community that are generating waste, and we can take it to organizations that need the food to feed people that are hungry. And that's what we're trying to do. We think that hunger in our community can be solved basically with some cooperation and logistics. So we use a direct food rescue model. That means that we're able to focus on fresh, nutritious, and soon to expire food. Um, this is food that traditional model food banks typically can't rescue because it goes bad too quickly. It's not in its original packaging. So an organization like Community Food Share, who does amazing work, can't really get this food. It's kind of hard to see on this projector, but this is a bin with about 60 pounds of uh, grapes and cherries in it, right around cherry season. And they were just amazing. And this, this was going in the trash, but we convinced Ideal Market to set it aside for us and took it to organizations that could use it. So we do all of our food rescue, or we try to do all of our food rescue. <laughs> <laughs> um, about 75% right now of our food rescue is with bikes. I was talking to Paula before um, the talks, and she saw Helen, who's here, um, struggling through the snow on Thursday. <laughs> um, so yeah, so if you, if you see people with bike trailers strapped to their bikes and funny orange vests and, and, big, uh, and big bins full of food, you know, wave, say hi. That's, that's us out there trying to move food around with bikes. So we've only been around two months, but we're pretty, we're pretty proud. We've been able to rescue about 6,000 pounds of food. Um, you can't really see in this picture, but there's people holding